torn down, that every life, that your name would be high, my God, my King. Father, we know that the name of Jesus is a high tower that the righteous run into, Father, and they are saved. We know that you are the banner of salvation. And my King, we pray that that name will be high and lifted up and that it will be glorified. Now, Father, as it is glorified, that it will be on the name of the lips of every man and woman in this area as they declare that Jesus Christ, the righteous, has healed, that he has delivered, that he has raised up, that he has wrought great and mighty miracles, that your glory would go out, Father, that men and women would be given a testimony that there is healing in the land again, that there is miracles in the land again, that there is righteousness in the land again, that glory has come up in the house of the Lord again, Father. God, I pray that your name, your name, that name of Jesus truly would be high and lifted up that every knee would bow before it my father we know there is none like you my king for all power all glory all might is in you all strength my God for not by might not by power but by your spirit and father we pray that by your spirit that your glory truly would prevail once again we cry out my God be it on earth as it is in heaven that your glory your glory would shine upon us father we pray that your indwelled presence would become your revealed presence that father your omnipresence would become an understanding stood presence, a moving wind and a blowing wind, my God, a raging torrent across each and every one of us, that that river of life would move and flow around us, my Father, that our loved ones would be saved, that the lost would be encouraged, that, Father, that you would put a hook in their jaw and begin to draw them in, that, Father, where they are so deep into darkness that they cannot find their way out, that your light would be a guiding draw to them, that, Father, it would be a hook that would draw them. Father, I pray even right now where the enemy thinks that he has written destruction on them, that even this very moment that you would write life across the top of their head and that Father that life would begin over the top of them and draw them from darkness into light that Father that the strong men of their life would be utterly crushed and destroyed and that they would be absolutely set free that they would be saved before it is too late that Father in your glory that great and mighty miracles would fall upon them and that they would be lifted up out of that dark despair and out of that pit of destruction and that they would be saved Father we give you the praise and the glory for it tonight, that these things will be done very quickly, my Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I praise you. In, in way of praying over our nation tonight, I want to read a little bit of a scripture, and then I want to pray over our nation, so if you would let me read this scripture, it's going to be very similar, or very um, familiar to you, except for, we always just take one verse out of this, but I want to read the pre-verses and the post-verses here a little bit. Out of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, the Lord said, The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now I want you to think about that just for a second. I've looked in the history books and I've read the accounts of what happened during the Revolutionary War. I've read the accounts of what happened with George Washington and how that at times he would ride his horse back and forth in front of the soldiers. And he would come out of those battles and there would be great numbers of holes through his coat, through his overcoat, where bullet after bullet had torn through his clothing, but never was his flesh pierced. I've read the accounts how that the Indians who were fighting on the side of the British would declare that he is a man that cannot be killed. Father, I have no doubt. That is a hand of providence that has established this nation as it is. Father, it is no doubt within my mind that a small number of men and women could cross the great and mighty sea in such small vessels with no idea where they are going like Abraham called out the Earl of Chaldees. Just go and they went. I have no doubt, my God, that it is the hand of providence that brought them across that great and raging ocean to land in this new land at Plymouth. Father, I have no doubt that it is by your hand that this land has been overtaken, that this government has overtaken the land, and that, Father, we stand one nation under God right now before you. I have no doubt within me, my God, you have chosen this land. Now, Father, we have been a place, a Christian nation, a house of sacrifice almost 200 years from our inception, from the day the first foot landed off of Plymouth. At Plymouth, Father, we have been named a Christian nation, a nation, one nation under you. The name of Jesus, always that banner. And so, Father, I believe that we are a chosen land, a chosen place, a church of sacrifice established here. Verse 13, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land and send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. 
and I will forgive their sins, and I will cure their land. Now, verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ear attentive to prayers made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. And so, Father, as we stand here before you tonight with our heads bowed as a representation of this nation, each and every one of us Americans, Father, today we can look and with our hearts heavy, We can look and see across this land that there is a lack of rain. Not a lack of of physical rain, but there has been a lack of spiritual rain. Father, it would even seem that the heavens have been closed. That darkness has overcome the land. That there is a drought upon us. Not a drought of physical water, my God. But a drought of the move of the Spirit. A drought of your glory. A drought of souls who would rise up and say there is good and there is evil. And there must be a line between. Father, it seems that there is a drought drought of truth it seems that there is a drought of your glory and father as we are looking as this scripture says that they that you would cause the locusts to be commanded to devour the land and it would even seem as there are the locusts the yes the demon horde that have moved across the land that have blinded eyes closed the ears, has made the heart cold, has made the mind heavy, has made the senses numb against you. It is as if darkness has become a pestilence among the people. And though it is not a disease of pestilence of the flesh but it is a diseased pestilence of the spirit, soul, of the mind that has caused them to embrace darkness become great spots of leprosy upon the soul and upon the mind and upon the heart. My God we have seen this with our own eyes. But yet you say if my people Those whom you say populate the house of sacrifice. Those whom you have chosen, my people, would call upon my name and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And so, Father, tonight, as a representation of this nation, we humble ourselves before you and we seek your face. Father, we know that we know that we know that without your glory, nothing will change. Without your power of your spirit, no man will be saved. And my God, we humble ourselves before you and we seek your face. My Father, as a representation of this nation right now, We repent of the wicked way of this land. Father, I repent today of innocent blood. A nation that would endorse the taking of the lives of the unborn. A nation that is so given. What life is and the sanctity of life and the love of life. That they drive by and shoot one another for no other reason than to see the blood flow. And Father, I stand before you and I repent. I repent of innocent blood. Father, I repent of hearts that devise evil continually. I repent of those who have intentionally closed their eyes. My God, I repent and I pray even right now that you will hear from heaven, that you will forgive our sins, and that you will heal our land, my God. Oh, Father, in this you said if we would humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, that you would hear, that you would heal our land. And so, my God, I pray right now that your eyes will be open, that your ears will be attended to our prayer and that you would begin the healing of our land right now my God you have chosen and sanctified this land you have chosen and sanctified this house put my God that from north and south and from east and west that your glory would overwhelm this land that a revival would break out like a great and mighty fire and would spread like a drought covered land and consume the dross my God that your glory would prevail upon us and that righteousness would prevail My father, this week I watched with my own eyes while the first time in modern history the leader of this land, this Christian nation, walked forward with a kipper on his head and walked over to the well, the wall of mourning and wailing. Father, I watched as he stood there in reverence, laid his hand upon that wall. Father, I watched as his wife over on the lady's portion of the wall in great reverence and humility. I watched as his daughter with great reverence and humility. I saw as his son-in-law stood there with him, all of them with great reverence and humility, going forward and laying their hand on that wall and declaring by speaking the name of Jesus on the steps of the Capitol at the day of inauguration and then by walking onto the old city and laying their hand on the old wall declaring we will stand with the Jew and with Israel and you said those who would bless you you would bless and those who would curse you you would curse and Father as he stood with his hand on that wall and he blessed your nation and he blessed your people and he declared your name Jesus high and lifted up so much pray that your blessings would overtake according to your own word. Let confusion die today. 
Let the voice of bitterness die today. Let the tongue of the false cleave to the roof of their mouth until they cannot even move their tongue in their head, until they hang their head in shame as they overcome by your glory and your light that would shine upon this administration. That, Father, your peace would lead and guide and direct. Father, I pray that as their hand was reached forward and touched that wall as a family, so, my God, I pray even right now that you would cause them to be encased around about with holy angels who would reach their hand forward and lay it upon them in the flesh that they would be supported, that they would be led and guided with truth and knowledge and wisdom, that they would know what they cannot know, see what they cannot see, hear what they cannot see, and understand what cannot even be understood, that no darkness would be able to touch, that no evil incantation would be able to have any power against them, but that your light would shine in power and strength. And Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Jared, Jared's going to come around and take up the offering. While he's doing that, I've got about a three-minute video I want y'all to watch. So y'all watch this. This is, go ahead, Jared. This is a video of the tsunami from back in uh, 2000, wasn't that 2004, 2005? It was a tsunami that hit in Thailand, I believe. So watch this video just for a second. I, it, it, and there's a point to it, so that's far enough. And there's a reason why I wanted to show you that video tonight. Very interesting. What did you notice watching that video? There's a few people yelling, run, run, run. What did you notice about the people on the beach just standing there? You noticed that they were just, they were in their bikinis, they had their lunch boxes, they had their kids, they had their lawn chairs. Notice they were just completely unaware of what was coming. They're sitting out there, and to them, the 30 seconds before the realization of what's happening and the 30 seconds after the realization of what's happening, entirely different. And they're sitting there and they can see this thing coming, but they have no concept. The guy in the red shorts right there, the last guy you saw at the end, the guy in the red shorts, he's just standing there looking at this thing. I don't know if he's overwhelmed. I don't know if his brain, if, the, you know, if, the, if he's short-circuited at this point and doesn't have a clue what's going on. Um, but you see him just standing there. There's no running. There's no terror. He's not screaming. He just gets overwhelmed. And what you don't realize is none of those people in that video are alive today. Not a single soul of any of those people who were on that beach would have survived. That was a 32-foot tall wave when it got to the beach. 32-foot tall. Every single one of those people within seconds of you seeing that video were wiped out. Dead, gone. And as I was watching that video, something struck me. Is that not just like the rapture of the church? Think about it. Right this minute, there are some of us who are yelling, run, run, run. Go to the cross as fast as you can get there. Get to the point of salvation. Do it now. Do it quick. Go, 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 go. There's a world full of people out there who are standing on the beach. And they're looking. Some of them are completely unaware. They have no idea what's coming. They have no idea what's about to overtake them. They have no concept of any kind of destruction. They are completely unaware. And even if they cast their eye over their shoulder and they see it way out there, they don't even have enough sense to be afraid. Those people there didn't even have enough sense to be afraid because they had so little understanding of what was coming, had no knowledge of what was coming. They knew there had been an earthquake. They knew there had been a little bit of shaking, but that had been hours before. So they had no idea. They were just, life was going on. Everything was good. They were marrying and giving in marriage. They were eating. They were drinking. They were enjoying life. And all of a sudden, this overwhelming swell overtakes them to their destruction. And I'll ask you again, is that not so much like the rapture? As you're sitting there and you're watching that destruction sweep down on those people. Can you imagine that there is coming a day when there is a trumpet that is going to sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those of us who remain will be caught up in the air to meet him in the clouds. And every single person that is not saved by the blood of Jesus does not call out upon his name. Every single one of them is going to be swept away by a tsunami of evil called the tribulation that is going to wash across the 
surface of this earth with a power and a strength and a destruction that has never been witnessed on this planet before. So think about that little boy in those red shorts standing there entirely unaware and swept away just that quick, that fast. The reason I wanted to show this and the reason I wanted to bring this up tonight is there will be a lot of you are asking this question, Pastor, why have you become so drunk in the glory? Why have you become so incensed with the glory of the Father and the face of the Father and the power of the Father and the presence of the Father? Why have you become so intoxicated with the moving power of His presence? Why have you become so overtaken by that? Why are you pushing us for it? Why do you want us to come up on Sunday morning and seek His face? Why are you pushing us for this kind of worship? Why are you continually talking about it? Why are you continually pushing us into it? And I'm going to tell you why. Because there is a world full of red-shorted little boys standing on the sides of the beach of this life and there is a wave that is going to overwhelm them and overtake them. And they are going to be utterly destroyed and lost for all eternity. And they are going to be swept into a hell that was only designed for Satan and his imps. That's all it was designed for. And they're going there by the thousands and the thousands. And I look in the book of Genesis and into Exodus. And I find a man named Moses who walked into the court of a man named Pharaoh. And he walked in with word, and he said back his word, let my children go. And Pharaoh chuckled under his voice, I do not know the God you speak of. I don't have a clue who you're talking about. Moses, you're so full of yourself. What are you even doing here? And Moses, carrying a staff within his hand, threw a staff down upon the ground, and that staff became a snake. Moses and the snake. Pharaoh chuckled. He called together his own sorcerers. His own sorcerers walked up and they threw down staffs that turned into snakes. Two. Moses never moved. The staff of Moses, the true representation of the true glory of God, walled over, slithered over to those other two snakes and took them by the head and swallowed them in their wholeness and in their entirety. It went to the first one and swallowed it completely. It went to the second one and swallowed it completely. It crawled its way back over to the foot of Moses. Moses bent over and picked that thing up and it instantaneously returned itself back into a staff in the hand of Moses. And Moses pointed his finger at Pharaoh and said, Let my children go. And I'm going to tell you, in these last days, evil is going to walk up in all kinds of power. They have the ability to do incantations. They have the ability to perform what seems to be miracles. They are even going to have the ability during the tribulation to call fire down from heaven. But I am here to tell you today that there is no darkness that can stand against the true power of the true glory of the living God. And if the glory of God shines in this place, in its full and its power every single lost person that sees it it will be a sign to them as it was when the staff of Moses devoured the staff of the snakes of those just doing incantations it will be a power that they will not be able to deny and they'll never stand on the beach of life again and see a wave coming in and say I did not know and I had no understanding that's why that I want to see the power of God why do I want to see the power of God move in such a fashion that people are slain in the spirit, that the spirit of the living God moves and people are changed. Because in his presence they will be healed, they will be rescued, they will be delivered, they will be set free. Their lives will be absolutely changed. Where in witchcraft and incantations and the works of the flesh, all they will do is feel better for a moment and go home. But in the grace and the power and the strength of the glory of God, they will bump into something that you can't wash off. You can't get it off your hand. You can't get it out of your mind. You can't get it off of your spirit. You can't get it out. It will be a touch that you cannot get away of. That is why I keep calling this congregation to a place where we put our heart and our minds together in one mind and one accord within ourselves. That whatever the cost, whatever the price, whatever it takes, however many days, however many prayers, however many tears, however many cries, however many shouts, however many times we have to do it, that it takes for the power of God to fall in this place like it did when it did not consume the bush, but burn the bush in front of Moses. So be it, whatever the cost, whatever it takes, however long it takes. Why? Because there's a world full of red-shorted little boys dying. And they have no concept of what is coming. But in the name of Jesus, with the fullness of the power of the Word of God, 
and then it being demonstrated by the grace and the glory of God, they will be saved. So that's why we're going to chase it. That's why we're going to pursue it. That's why we are going to continue to look for his face. That's why we're going to do what we're doing every service. It's never too late. That's exactly right. So anyway, I just that's the reason I wanted to show you all that video. I really hope. That, that video haunts you for two or three days. I really hope that little boy in those red shorts wakes you up in the middle of the night tonight. I really hope that those families standing there with those kids looking out at that wave invade your consciousness for two or three days. And, then, and when it wakes you up in the middle of the night and you see that wave coming in, I hope you see printed across it the word rapture. Rapture, because I think it's coming. I think we are infinitely close. I think the day is at hand. I think we need to be very serious about intentionally moving forward in the glory of God to see the power of God revealed in these last days so that men and women will be saved. They will be saved. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop that and go on to our study tonight. We've got to get to Jacob. So I'm going to give you the cliff note version of Jacob tonight. Are you all ready for that? How many of you read Genesis chapter 25? Uh, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Anita, thank you that you're, that's a lot of reading. So I know, I know I gave you a lot, a lot of reading. I actually asked you to read this story thinking that one time thinking that you were Isaac, one time thinking you were Rebecca, one time thinking you were Esau, and one time thinking you were Jacob. Now, most of you know this story a little bit, if at least. Uh, there was a guy named Isaac. He's got two kids, Esau and Jacob. His wife's name is Rebecca. Just give you the very short version here real quick. Mama says, go in to daddy, tell him a lie. Still brother's birthright. Already sold, sold his birthright for the uh, pottage. You go get the uh, blessing of the firstborn. It all happens. Jacob has to run off. Finally comes back. Kissy face, kissy face. They all make up. Y'all all remember the story, right? Ask, let me ask you this question. How does that story play out if you're Isaac? Well, let's just ask a few questions. If you're Isaac... The day after all that goes down, how do you feel about your wife? No, at least we have one honest person in the room. If you're Isaac, the day after that happens, how do you feel about Esau? You feel sorry for Esau. How do you feel about Jacob? Probably not his, your, he's probably not your favorite child at the moment, right? If you're Jacob, how are you feeling about yourself? Scared? Proud? Prideful? If you're Esau, how do you feel about your brother? Not a real happy. How do you feel about your mama? Yeah, how do you feel about your daddy? I mean, would you, and, and what I'm trying to get you to do, asking you these questions is, look, when you read the scripture, don't read it like it's just a fairy tale. Don't read it like these are just characters that are so far removed from humanity. As you're reading these stories, read through that and ask yourself, what if I was Isaac? What would this story mean to me? If I was Jacob, what would this story mean to me? And when you do that, you begin to learn different stuff. And, um, <clears throat> As you go look at this, if you really begin to do some study, the Jews called Jacob a man of truth. So for all of you in there, how many of you would say that Jews, Jacob was a man of truth? Anybody in this room? Uh, maybe, I don't know. We'll see in a minute. How many of you would say Jacob was a man of truth? To bring about a great, after God changed his name, he became that man of truth. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. If we go back and we look, and I wanted to read through all this tonight, but we won't read the whole story because I'd have to read five chapters. But, but as we go through this, if you remember, Rebecca got a word of prophecy. Whenever the two boys were inside of her and there was this war going on and she cried out to God and said, God, if, I, if this is by you, why is there such turmoil going on with inside of me? There was continually this tussle. And remember, God gave her a prophecy. The younger will rule the older and the older will serve the younger and on and on. And so let me ask you this question. Does Rebecca's re prophecy that she received make what they did okay? I think she did. And I, think, and I also think that Isaac knew the prophecy, and then Jacob knew the prophecy, and I don't know about Esau, but I think they, they, that it had been told. I do. And so let me ask you this, another question. And um, out of whom was the deception born? Did Isaac create the deception? Did Rebekah create the deception? Who was the birther of the deception? All right, we're going to look at that in just a minute. There is so many angles in this story that we've got to pull up. That prophecy, and I, yo, 
I think that's a very real likelihood. Did she not see betrayal in this? Or did she think that, it, that God's word, that the promise of God was so important that whatever you could do to bring it about was okay? Just like Sarah trying to bring about a son and bringing in Hagar. You know, as you begin to look at that. So there's a lot of questions. And well, here's something I want to throw out there. This is a flashpoint in, in the old book, in the Old Testament. And you cannot understand this whole story. If you take just the prophecy for Rebecca and look at, make it stand by itself, you take the, the pottage of stew and you make it stand by itself, you take the, the deception and you make it stand by itself, you take Isaac, uh, excuse me, you take Jacob all the way over there uh, looking for a wife and all the years he spent and you make it stand by itself. If you don't pull all that together and take about five chapters and put it together, you'll never understand what this story's about. You'll get the idea that lying's okay, that helping God in the flesh is just wonderful, that it's all right to do whatever it takes to get ahead and to cheat is just fine. And that's not what any of this story tells us. And so there's been a lot of confusion about a lot of this, and so we're going to run through that. So you have to look at all of this and say, what is the punchline in the end? And uh, I want to throw this out there to you, just something for you to think about. Did you ever thought about this, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God said, I, you, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told you the other day, they're th they're, all three of these men, their greatest struggle was with their kids. Do you realize all three of these men had to give up a son? Abraham had to give up Ishmael, and he had to give up Isaac in symbol, right? Isaac has two sons, and they get in a tussle between of them, one of them, and he loses Jacob for 21 years. He has to lose a son. Jacob has a son that ends up trapped in Egypt and he thinks he's dead because he had a coat of many colors and it comes back to him torn and covered in blood Abraham Isaac and Jacob all three of those men had to mourn the death even symbolically of a son where was their greatest promise in their sons where was their greatest struggle in their sons where did they have to pay the greatest cost in their sons isn't that interesting that all three of them had to do that let me throw this out there to you as you're getting started something that every person in this room needs to hear for good teaching you cannot do what is illegitimate in an effort to bring about the legitimate you need to write that down in your spiritual journal somewhere you cannot 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 do what is illegitimate in an effort to bring about the legitimate it's extremely important that you understand that you cannot you cannot hide your tithe in your pocket in an effort to become prosperous. You cannot lie to the IRS in an effort to become prosperous. You cannot do, you cannot do any illegitimate thing in an effort to receive or bring about what is legitimate. In other words, if you have a promise from God, if you have a prophecy from God, and you can see a way that you can bring it about by twisting, by turning, by doing anything in your flesh, your way, if I push this button, twist this knob, kick this leg right here, then this gold bar is going to fall out. Guess what? In the push, the turn, and the kick, you'll sin. And you'll take what was legitimate and make it illegitimate in your life because you cannot do what is illegitimate and ever get what is legitimate. I've got a lot of wrinkled foreheads and a lot of really quiet people thinking really hard right this second. So as we are going through uh, looking at this, let me point out a couple of things. It, Genesis chapter 25, let me bring this story down to a kind of a um, cliff note version. In Genesis chapter 25, we've got a miracle birth. You've got identical twins. Four different times in this story, the Bible's going to say they were struggling. There was a prophecy about one over the other. Again, with identical twins, remember this, that identical twins share resources inside the womb. How many of you have ever noticed that oftentimes when you have identical twins, you'll have one strong, one weak, one larger, one smaller. Sometimes one will have health issues and one doesn't have health issues. Anybody ever notice that? Why is that? Because there was a struggle inside the womb for what we would call limited resources. Everybody say limited resources. It's an extremely important part of this story. 
the struggle over limited resources. One comes out red and hairy. He's healthy. He's well formed. He's wonderful. His daddy loves him. He walks first, talks first, shoots farther, runs faster, jumps higher, is better in all those athletic ways. They, being Isaac and Rebecca, call this one Esau, which means hands or the doer and provider. So Esau was a doer. He was a provider. He would go out and kill the meat and bring it in and dress it for daddy. He was a doer like daddy was. And then you had the other one. His name was Jacob. How, how many of you remember the story of the birth? Esau has come out. He's just been born. All of a sudden a hand shoots out and what's that hand do? He grabs a hold of the heel of Esau. Instantly, he gets a name. From that day forward, Esau, hands, doer, provider, a great name for a young man. All of a sudden, Jacob, the hand shoots forward, grabs the brother by the heel, remember the prophecy. And instantly, his name becomes Jacob, which means the healer, H-E-E-L-E-R, not H-E-A-L-E-R, the healer, grabbing by the heel. And it means to be crooked. To be the healer, H-E-E-L-E-R, means to be crooked, to twist, to connive, to be, a, to be a debater. And Jacob was considered to be a man of the voice. He became very cunning. He was a talker. He was weaker than his brother. He stayed in the tent with his mom. He knew how to cook. He knew how to sew. He knew how to do all those things. Mother took him in. Daddy took Esau in. We have a difference between mama and daddy. And all of a sudden... Jacob becomes a man of cunning. He's wise. He knows how to twist and turn. He becomes a man of great cunning to make things happen his way. Isaac loves Esau because he's a doer. Mama loves Jacob because he's her houseboy. He, and by the way, Jacob hates his name. How many of you remember the story of how Jacob ends up with the birthright? Esau's out hunting. Esau's coming back in from hunting. Esau says, I am so starved to death, I'm about to die. Anybody ever wondered, what was Jacob doing sitting there cooking stew anyway? I mean, I just don't make a habit of going out on the edge of the woods and starting up a campfire and cooking stew. What was he doing out there in the first place? He was waiting on Esau. Why was he waiting on Esau? Because how many times had he heard his brother come in after a long period of time hunting and he hasn't been able to kill anything and so famished and so hungry and just about to fall over and faint. And so Esau is out there hunting. Jacob goes out and pretty much has an idea where he's at. And so he cooks him up a fine pot of wonderful smelling stew. I wouldn't be surprised if he was standing there with a fan fanning the smell of the stew out into the woods. Esau comes along very faint, about to die, and this, then now we have it. Jacob, yeah, you can have a pot, but I got something I want. What do you want? I want the birthright. What was the birthright? We've got to understand what birthright meant. Remember this? In this society, the oldest son inherited everything. The oldest son inherited everything. The oldest son was the one who carried the, carried the inheritance. Even all the way back in, down and through the Mosaic Law, the oldest son carried the inheritance. He inherited the land. He inherited the cattle. He inherited the servants. He inherited the money. He inherited everything. And so what Esau said was, I'm going to die anyway. What good is a birthright? What's good to a, a goat to a dead man? So yeah, fine. You take the birthright and I'll eat the stew. And just like that. Esau sells the birthright, hates his birthright for, the, for a pot of stew. And we look at that. Go ahead, Anita. I think he, had a, I think he should have known what it, what it meant, number one. Number two, I think that he probably didn't really think his brother would carry through with it. And he cried over it later. Yes, he sold it. Yeah, and it was, and it was because once it was said, it was law. That, they, they exchanged, that was a gift exchange, that was a covenant they were cutting between them as brothers. Yeah. Now watch this. Extremely, I mean, we got to learn as we're going through this. We're all sitting here thinking, how did Esau do it? Isaac was a rich man. Cattle and servants. He had 
everything. And you mean to tell me that for a momentary instant amount of pleasure just to fill his belly with something warm that he would sell everything he had? Listen to me. Your heavenly father owns the cattle of a thousand hills, the gold under the hills and the taters under the hills and the cattle on top of the hills, how we say it sometimes in Arkansas. He is infinitely rich, has given you eternal life, everything pertaining to life and to godliness in this life and in the next life. He's made you a king and priest unto God and Satan will sit there at the side of the woods and he will pop, go and cook up a pot of earthly pleasure and he'll fan the smell out into the woods and draw you right over to it and he'll pick up a pot of pottage and he will say to you, I will sell you your birthright if you'll just take a bite. And how many saints of God look at it and think, he won't really charge that to me. He won't, it won't really cost me that much. I'll get it back. He'll forget about that later. Daddy loves me best. There's really not death in that pot. And they take up the pot and they eat out of that pot. And they walk away from it not realizing that they just created a legal contract in the spirit realm for the wage of sin is death. And they just ingested into them a small thing with huge and lasting repercussions. And we look at Esau and we point a point your finger at him and go, boy, you lost your mind. You mean to tell me you couldn't walk ten more steps to mama's tent and it got the same thing? And we find ourselves at the exact same place at the, with the exact same offer and we can't walk ten more steps away from it and fall at the altar of God where we could have got the exact same thing. Isn't that very interesting? That we find ourselves in this same boat over and over and over and over and over. There's two bowls of soup in the story, in the fullness of the story. And one of them gets, uh, Esau eats one of them, Isaac eats the other one. Two bowls of soup in the story there. Now, jumping on, kind of, kind of just continuing to run through. Genesis chapter 26. Uh, you, and I, again, we're not reading all this, uh, all of this for essence of time, but 26, verse 34 and 35. When Esau was 40 years old, he took wives of Judith, the daughter of Berei, the Heatite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elion, the Heatite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. So we're beginning to see a pattern here. All of a sudden, not only has Esau sold his birthright, but now he's gone outside the family lineage to marry. And Isaac and Rebekah, he's driving them out of their mind. Anybody in the room has got kids? You understand what I just read. Those of you who don't have kids, you may not understand so well. But sometimes your kids can do stuff that are a grief of mine. You wake up thinking, what are they doing? You go to bed thinking, what are they doing? And all day in between, you're thinking, what are they doing? You know, and, uh, and it can happen. And that's what we find here. Esau is not following a good path. Now, if you jump over to Genesis, then over to Genesis chapter 27, verse 1 through 46, we could read this. Uh, again, I don't want to read it all, but here's where Isaac's about to get the blessing. Uh, Isaac is old. He says to Esau, I'm about to die, but I want you to notice something. Interesting part of this story. Isaac says, I am about, I'm an old man, I'm going to die very soon, Esau. Go out and kill an, a, a, a venison, cook it up for me, bring it to me, and I'm going to go ahead and give you the blessing. How long did I just tell you that Jacob was gone? 21 years. Guess who was still alive when he got back? Isaac. Isaac. Isn't that interesting? Was Isaac really about to die? No, he wasn't. Was there only one deception taking place in this story? No, there wasn't. I believe this, this is just commentary, thus saith chat. I believe that Isaac loved Esau. He had a, had a heart for Esau, and he knew that Esau had lost the birthright. Even though it's 21 years later, he's still alive. He says to him in a secret moment, Son, go do this very quickly. Come back, and I will go ahead and give you the blessing because I believe he knew the prophecy of Rebekah, and he wanted to short-circuit the prophecy of Jacob serving or Esau serving Jacob and wanted to force Jacob to serve Esau and his the deception actually began with Isaac trying to short circuit the prophecy of God again a man trying to do what was illegitimate instead of what was legitimate isn't that interesting 
I don't think Isaac was about to lay down and die. A man sick enough to about lay down and die, generally without medical care, you didn't find him still alive 21 years later. That's more than just a few days. So I think that is actually where the deception started. So anyway, as you're going through there, you'll find Rebecca said, Hey, I heard your father saying this. Bring me this game. So brother, let's do this. Let's go ahead. We're going to kill this young lamb. And we're going to cook it up real quick. And I'm going to take the hair and I'm going to put it on the back of your neck. And I'm going to put it on your arm. And you're going to go in and feed this to your daddy. And he's going to give you the blessing. Let me ask you a question. What are the odds this are going to work? I mean, look, I know he's red and hairy. I know Isaac's losing his eyesight. But really, we're going to take the skin off a dead lamb. We're going to put it on. We're going to make it like a glove. He's going to rub it. Going to put it on the back of your neck. I mean, he's blind, but he's not stupid. What are even the odds that this was going to work? I mean, if I was Jacob, I'd be sitting there listening to mom going, you've lost your mind. He's going to catch me in this, and we're all going to be in trouble. And I think that that conversation did kind of take place. Jacob said, look, uh, Esau's red and hairy. I'm smooth skin. My father's going to feel me. He's going to think I am a deceiver. What was his name? The healer. The cunning one. The deceiver. He's been living his whole life hating this name under the shadow of this name. And what he says right here to his mother is, please don't make me fulfill my name. My father will look at me and say, that name belongs to you. It's stuck like it's supposed to. You're exactly what I thought you were this whole time. And I can see inside Jacob's heart this rending within him. I hate this name. Why do I have to do it this way? A struggle with inside his heart where this name is forcing him to drive forward, ever forward. He says, my father will fill me, he'll put a curse on me. And his mother says, let the curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go into him. And so they do exactly that. They cook the food. She makes, uh, makes, gets some clothes of Esau, puts them on him. So that way when Esau, uh, if, when uh, Isaac smells Esau's clothes, he'll smell like an outer field instead like the perfumed robes at, of the mother's house, on and on. So they put this elaborate scheme together. He goes in. Y'all know the story. Isaac says, you sound like Jacob. And he says, no, I'm Esau. Come here. And he fills his hand and Pulls him down like he's going to kiss him and smells his clothes and feels the nap of his neck. And he says, the voice is the voice of a deceiver. Because what does Jacob's name mean? The voice sounds like the voice of a deceiver. But it feels like and smells like Esau. And he gives him the blessing. Now let me ask you this question. My dad scolded this scripture a while ago. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And they that eat, love it eat the fruit thereof. Esau comes back in. Just moments later, Isaac, he goes into Isaac and says, I've brought you what you asked. Isaac immediately begins to yell and scream and weep. What's happened? And instantly, I want you to notice, Isaac's countenance changes, and he says, I've given away your blessing, and so shall it be. He goes from mourning to immediately he just accepts it and he drops it and he he doesn't rant and rave about Jacob's done this oh this is horrible he immediately accepts it and I think in that moment he Isaac said within himself there was a prophecy for this I got caught in my own deception I was trying to do something here and twist this and Jacob has gotten exactly what God said should have been his in the first place imagine this How would this story have been different if Jacob had walked into the tent of his father as Esau was out there hunting and said, Father, there's a prophecy and you stand against God and you know that he's supposed to serve me and I'm supposed to serve him. Do you think it's possible that Isaac's heart could have turned and that instead of doing a a legitimate thing illegitimately, had he done the legitimate thing the legitimate way? Could it have been done in such a way that he didn't have to leave his family for 21 years and leave with his brother hating him and hoping he was dead? Isn't that interesting? As we begin to think on the times in our life where we've had promises of God, promises in the Word, promises that He's spoken to us in prophecy, and we've tried to make it work out in the flesh, and we've really made a mess where if we'd have just done it right, what could the end have been? I think this story, as we go through that, really kind of keep, keeps us in the idea of thinking along that way. Oh, i got to stop. How come somebody didn't tell me I was already long-winded? I, hadn't, I can't see the clock from right here. One more thing I want to point out before we go on any farther. As you go down, when it's all found out, 
Rebecca says this. Jacob did this to you. When it all got started, Rebecca said, if it gets found out, let the curse be on me. Remember, I asked you at the very beginning, who did this? Rebecca? Rebecca then says, it was Jacob. Or was it really Isaac? I'll leave you thinking on that. I'll leave you thinking on that. Rebecca said, I'll take the curse. Then when it was found out, she blamed it on Jacob. But was it really Isaac? (laughs) It does put you in some deep thought here, doesn't it? So let me remind you as we're leaving, God is not a God of limited resources. If I could have done this study good justice tonight, I told you that struggle was mentioned four times all over limited resources. Stop struggling against your brother over limited resources. God is not a God of limited resources.